Um, Richard must have, uh, I've lost count of them, maybe 15 books. And uh, one of them, The Blessing, is a compilation of six books. So uh, if, I don't know if he has any more left to sell, but if he does, uh, it, if you've never had his early books, they are uh, as good a series of poems as I think I've ever read. Um, the first book, Country of Air, it's a, it's a trilogy and then there's three more books. Country of Air is a book that I came upon and when I read it, I was immediately, I guess 35 years ago, I was immediate, immediately struck by the quality of the writing and the authenticity of the writing and the clarity of vision and the trueness of, the, of his great heart. Um, you don't find a lot of that, uh, even one of those, but when you get all four of them together, it's a, it's a, uh, it, it's, it's a miracle. And lo and behold, he's coming to read here at Beyond Baroque with Sam Hamill, who's a very well-known poet and translator and editor, and they asked me to be the third poet to read with them, and I thought, oh, wow, that's cool. <laughs> and Richard got a hold of me, and he said, let's, let's have <coughs> lunch. I'd like to meet you. So we met over in the cafe right across from Scientology, where Richard was staying with a friend. And, <laughs> you know, you know so I don't, except for the people that are in my classes, uh, I find poets a little neurotic, you know. And so, uh, not like actors who are neurotic, but interesting. Uh, so I love hanging around with actors, but poets, you know, it's like, you know. But uh, Richard was neurotic, but my kind of neurosis, you know, I, 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 lo I loved his spirit. We got along so well, and we have been friends for, I don't know, Richard, maybe you've counted the years, uh, a long time. And I've read all his books, and these are some of them on the wall here. Uh, I love his titles, as a matter of fact. That was Country of Air, the first one. Then, at last, we enter paradise, and then the correct spelling and exact meaning, which as a poet, this is an important title for him. And this is kind of a trilogy. These three books are masterpieces. They, they go together. Um, but in The Blessing, you not only get these three, but you get... Um, Oh, well, no, Perfect Time is the third of the trilogy. Then Correct Spelling, and then Apropos of Nothing. And today, he has a new book, The Str Stranger on Earth, which could be read different ways. He could be a stranger on Earth, or he could be saying, well, you know, everything's okay on Pluto, but it thinks a stranger on Earth. <laughs> so it has a kind of a double meaning, and it is a compilation of six of his books. It's really an amazing book. And I think, I don't know if he's run out, but if you get Stranger on Earth and The Blessing, he throws in The Obscure Hours, which is an amazing book with color photographs, uh, color paintings, it's just great. He throws that in for free. So that's a good deal. Um, so for both of us to be having our books published today and have a chance to read, it's a, I just, for me, it's a, it's a great experience. And uh, we're doing so many readings in two, two days. It's just been a wonderful experience. Uh, and for me to introduce him to you, a poet that I dearly love as a human being and as an amazing poet uh, who captures the human spirit and what it is like to be alive on this earth, there is no equal to Richard Jones. Would you give him a hand? So I'll begin with a poem by Rilke. This is called Grave Hour. Who weeps now somewhere in the world, weeps for no reason in the world, weeps for me? Who now laughs somewhere in the night, without reason laughs in the night, laughs at me? Who now goes somewhere in the world, without reason goes in the world, goes to me? who now dies somewhere in the world, without reason dies in the world, looks at me. So um, I, I feel very much at home here because I've been here a few times and 
the reading that Jack was talking about was really, for me, kind of, you know, it was like being born. Um, I love reading in Los Angeles, so I love being here with you. Um, when you read in the Midwest, it's, it's a very different experience because you read your poem and then people go, But here, you know, you read and sometimes people will go, ooh. You know? <laughs> so, uh, so I've been writing for a long time and um, I had my family a bit late. My youngest is uh, my daughter, Sarah. She's 16. So now when I have a draft that I feel is complete, I'll have her read it and I'll say, Sarah, will you read a poem? She goes, how long is it? <laughs> I, say, I say, it's not too long, not too long. And then she'll go to the computer and she'll do her hand, you know, to scroll it up, you know, on the computer. And then she reads all the way down. She goes, oh, I like that. <laughs> My heart soars like an eagle. <laughs> so this poem is called My Samovar. And if you didn't have your samovar out this morning, a samovar is those old Russian tea kettles that are uh, quite big. They're, you know, mine stood about this tall and the little tea, uh, little tea kettle sits on top of it. Um, they're quite beautiful. My samovar. Whatever happened to the samovar my wife purchased at a flea market in Cleveland and presented to me on my birthday with wishes that I should live forever? Ornate, sumptuous, the samovar commanded attention and fetched compliments for its beauty. It wouldn't have simply vanished. Tall, round, vase-shaped, a copper and brass work of art in the dining room, entire chapters of life I wrote at its table, brewing black tea and pouring it from the jeweled and gilded teapot that sat atop the inscribed kettle like a little god that invited not only the body but also the soul to partake medicinal and therapeutic, the samovar guided us through each day, each season, insisting we slow down, live slowly. Mint, jasmine, orange peel, rose, linden flowers, lemon, tea with champagne, tea with blueberries and currants, honey tea, peach tea, tea with apples, I drank them all from a tulip-shaped tea glass. My wife preferred a white porcelain cup. Our ceremonies were quiet, serene, characteristically Japanese, or ritualistic and proper in the English manner. But sometimes, like Turks or Russians, we were unrestrained and expansive, everybody talking as music played and the children ran around eating cookies and cakes. I must admit, it is strange to lose a samovar. If I could lose it, what else at this moment might be slipping away? Without my seeing or knowing, what else like my beloved samovar has gone missing and now is lost, never to return? I like that line from my wife, wishes that I might live forever. Um, we think we're gonna live forever. Uh, we were talking the other night about poetry and, and making a living, and I teach to make a living. And uh, sometimes I think that I'm not so much teaching poetry, but just you know, talking about that fact, like, are we going to live forever? And I try and suggest to my students, I mean, it's a relativistic universe, and so we all have different opinions about things, but I suggest there's a maybe 95% chance that we might die. <laughs> The river of time. It's raining, so for my ninth class, I pass out a poem about the boatman who ferries souls across the river of time. A poem I've copied from the original Latin by hand in ink on paper I've made from pulp of daylilies, iris leaves, and my secret ingredient, obituaries. <laughs> I instruct the students as I rise ceremoniously to please translate the lines, if not into English, 
than into any language they choose, French or German, or perhaps a language of their own invention, reminding them as I step backward, the doorknob in my hand, the door opening, thunder rumbling in the night to seize the day. Finally, excusing myself with a slight bow as I take the boatman's hand and step into the little boat that waits, bobbing on the river outside the classroom door. The rain comes harder, and the boatman, huddled under his black cowl, sets burning eyes on the distant shore. I rest my hand on the boatman's shoulder, and as we float down river toward the unseen world across the water, I turn and bid my students farewell, waving my scarf, blowing kisses, crying out as I am ferried away, au revoir, arrivederci, vaya con Dios. So I was saying last night that I like coming to Los Angeles because, and excuse me, I, I have a cold, I'm sorry. I like coming to Los Angeles. Um, one, I like coming to Los Angeles, I'm not in Chicago where it really is cold, um, but I brought it with me. Um, because I meet a lot of psychoanalysts here. <laughs> and, and I also meet a lot of people who are in psychoanalysis. So it's my kind of town. This is called Freud's Glasses. <laughs> I had mixed feelings about visiting Freud's home in Maresfield Gardens, a short walk from Hampstead Heath and the Keats house. I didn't want to stir up the old wretchedness, yet when I stood in the doctor's office, I felt no shame, no sin, only a sacred calm, as if I'd come to a place of refuge and acceptance. The famous round-rimmed glasses, casually displayed on the desk as if the doctor had just stepped away for a moment, twinkled in the pallid window light. I imagined putting the glasses on and seeing myself when I was young and trying to find a way through a series of breakdowns. I recalled the first time I delivered myself to the emergency room. I couldn't explain. And the worried interns didn't know what to do with me. I was taken to see the head of psychiatry, a middle-aged woman who told me I shouldn't take life so seriously. <laughs> I went home and sat in the dark, wondering what Sartre or Rothko might have said. <laughs> in, the, in the ensuing decades, I wrote books and went broke paying one doctor after the other. Impossible task, staying alive. <laughs> Yet my heart sought the light. Had Freud stepped back into the office, I'd have asked how to account for my late awakening. And it is all right with him if I use a word such as heart. I opened the museum guest book, signed my name with a flourish, and drew a heart pierced by an arrow. Then I bid farewell to the totems and coffin masks and statues of Eros and walked through the quiet neighborhood until I found a tea shop. Sitting by the window, I wished those young interns from my past could join me. I'd pour tea and we'd talk about everything, suffering and poetry, futility and the fullness of life, the privilege of being human, the sun that rises from an ocean of sorrow, the light that floods our world. The coffin shop. I asked my grown boys if they remembered the coffin shop. I'd taken them there when they were little. The storefront was only blocks from our old house and driving by one day, I stopped. I recall unbuckling the safety seats and the quiet and polite way the gray-suited owner with a carnation in his lapel greeted us. I told him we were only looking. <laughs> as, the, as the boys and I proceeded to stroll the aisles as if shopping for bikes or ambling through the stillness of a museum to consider the timeless art. But time 
had won. My children laughed. They claimed no recollection of the day or my voice whispering in their ears how much I loved them as I lifted my sons in my arms to look deep into those boxes of shiny satin and velvet. One reason you see me uh, sort of looking down when I read, I know that I'm in a town that's known for performance, and I know you're supposed to, when you read, um, hang on. When you read, you know, you're supposed to like look at your audience and capture their eyes, you know, and, and move and, and use your voice, right? Um, but I can't do that. So I, I really need to look in because my eyes are really terrible. I'm virtually blind. And uh, a couple of years back, I was at a friend's house and I was chatting with him. And in the middle of our conversation, I said, I'm, I'm going blind. And in fact, I was. My retina had torn. And what happens in that moment is your eye fills with blood. And so that's why you can't see out. And the thing is, is that the doctor can't see in. So you have to sit for a very long time until the blood sort of settles down. Mine never did. I eventually had to go and have this surgery to have it all. Anyway, horrible story. Um, so when I read, I have to put on my glasses and I have to really kind of get in here. And so that's why I, I hunker down. So forgive me for that. So I look away from you and that's just the way, that's just the way that is. So I'm going to put on my glasses and go into this poem called Throne of Dreams. So I'm going away, I go away from you. But you know, I, I also don't hear very well, so. <laughs> so I'm not looking at you and I can't hear you, so you can just talk among yourselves and when, when I'm done, I'll signal and you can listen to the in-between bits, you know. <laughs> okay, Throne of Dreams. When my retina tore, my right eye filled with blood. The doctor who promised to cure my blindness told me, you are not to read or write. Fearing the back and forth eye movement would cause permanent damage and loss of vision. I was to sit and not move, to sleep upright at night, to be perfectly still. This I did for 40 days. I found my house had many chairs. <laughs> the gray chair in the den with the armrest, where with closed eyes I could meditate for hours. And the green wrought iron chair in the garden, where I listened to birds, wind, high in the maples, and the dull clapping of bamboo wind chimes. By the fireplace, my father's tall wing-back chair helped me remember how quiet he became at the end of his life, how peaceful an old soldier reminding me they also serve who only stand and wait. And at night, there was at the foot of the bed where my wife slept, the small white sofa. I put a hassock under my feet and sat up straight to sleep in the valley between two mountains of pillows and blankets, a makeshift throne of dreams, soft as a cloud, drifting higher and higher. Don't read or write? I had repeated back to the doctor that first day in his office. He didn't know what he was saying. <laughs> but he also didn't know I am blessed to have a daughter. She carefully taps each line I say into a silver laptop computer, then reads everything slowly back to me, making corrections and suggesting changes. <laughs> Sage little improvements she insists upon before letting the poem go, alone into the wide darkness and gloom to sing and shine and share its joy. Wow. So that's my daughter Sarah that I was talking about. Um, uh, this next poem is a persona poem. Now, this is a room of, of literary people. We know what a persona poem is, yes? It's when you inhabit a character. And in this poem, I inhabit the character of my daughter, Sarah. So it's Sarah that I am becoming, yes? So I explained this at great length at a reading a few months back. And at the end of it, a really well-regarded, well-known poet like raised her hand and said, how did you get into your daughter's diaries? 
And I went, oh, okay. Anyway, so the title I want you to notice is Unwritten Excerpt from My Daughter's Diary. Unwritten Excerpt from My Daughter's Diary. The Hollow Men and My Father. And it has a, this one has an epigraph from T.S. Eliot. I rejoice that things are as they are. Isn't that great? Yeah. My man. Mm. I rejoice that things are as they are. Wow, how many of us got up this morning and said that? <laughs> Unwritten excerpt from my daughter's diary. The hollow man and my father. My father sees affirmation in the saddest lives, in the most sorrowful poetry. All afternoon in a London pub, he nurses a pint of bitter and reads Eliot. Poetry, he says, widens his ken and affords a clear vision of the interconnectedness of all things. He says the hollow men makes him think of poor Vivian Eliot, the poet's delicate wife who suffered nervous breakdowns. My once unbelieving father now stands against the odds like Eliot on the strong rock of faith. But it is Vivian's fragility and self-absorption my father relates to, having had in his youth his own trembling chapters. Brilliant but mad Vivian, divorced, abandoned, and left in a mental institution. He sighs. Hollow men don't know how to love, he says. My father's eyes are blue. In them I see no judgment. The world is fallen, he says, as he lifts his glass, but does not drink. Even the poets are lost, he says. And so how to account for the pleasure Eliot's poems give my father? How do I account for the joy my father finds in each moment, his loving attention to the smallest details? Everything in his mind deserves affirmation, even brokenness, even the wasteland, believing all will be redeemed. He finally smiles at me and tells me he counts his blessings. He asks whether I like my tea. Am I enjoying my cookie? What am I writing about in my notebook? In order, I answer yes, and it's delicious and nothing. <laughs> he smiles again. He knows when I say nothing, it is secret code for I'm writing about everything in the universe. I'm writing about love. I'm writing about my father. I'm writing about the light. Um, I got hit by lightning and uh, I went home and told my family and I walked in and they were watching TV and I said, I got hit by lightning and they all looked at me and like, yeah, you know, <laughs> come on. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I, I teach at DePaul and, and they put us in this room that it's kind of, it's, it's like this room, but, but maybe like a 50th of it. It's a small little black hole. So I take my students and we go up to the faculty lounge and I say, and we have all these nice cozy chairs. And it's got this round window and you can see out and it's beautiful. But one evening, I teach in the in summer in the night and you can see the storm coming. And sure enough, before we finished, it was just like amazing thunderstorm. Well, this was at a time when I would finished a writing project and I was doing this experiment where normally, because I write a lot, uh, I walk around with several saddlebags of manuscripts and books and pens and <laughs> staplers and small Xerox machines, you know. Um, and I decided I was going to go through this period of my life where I was going to go like this. <laughs> Just walking, no books, no poems. And so that night, uh, this huge storm came, and I walked out, and I was just walking along, just me and my umbrella. Afterward, leaving work late one summer night, I looked up to the atrium, drenching rain polishing the skylight. A darkly gleaming sheen on the glass illumined every few moments by lightning strikes and rattled by concussive thunder. I'd spent the day tinkering the line 
impossible task staying alive, thinking about the rack and ruin of my youth and what Hemingway had said, the world breaks everyone. And afterward, many are strong at the broken places. And then the storm's intensity seemed to complete the day's meditation. I dawdled in the doorway, relishing the downpour, smiling, twirling my umbrella, a song gathering in my chest as I studied the tempest, the wild sky, the wind and rain, the flashing clouds, torrents shining in the street lamp's light. I stepped out under the sycamores, walking the empty street, instantly soaked and perfectly happy, I began to hum a little tune. The blowing rain felt good, cool, and refreshing, and I was glad my hands carried nothing, only a companionable red umbrella. No briefcase, no burden to weigh me down. My spirit so light, I thought the storm would lift me up and carry me away. It almost made me sad to see my car waiting that night all alone in the sea of the flooded parking lot. The fierce rain coming down so hard, the shining asphalt was blacker under its inch of water. In the same moment, sudden lightning. My eye just quick enough to see the swift spark splinter and lash across the rooftops. A charged finger that instantly sought the tip of my umbrella arced down the spoke, then leaped to trace the curve of my right ear, an almost amorous caress, thrilling and tender as a whisper of longing while darkness raves and rants and rails. And that was all. In the empty parking lot, keys in hand, I stood, broken still, perhaps, but italicized and stronger than I'd been minutes earlier, walking devil may care under the sycamores and singing a little tune. <laughs> this is called Margins. In the quiet after dinner, we sit in the living room and I tell my children gathered around me that each day we compose the story of our lives between the blank margins of existence, barrenness, and bleakest despair. The three of them listen, calmly indulging me, smiling, having heard their father recite a thousand such monologues. As the evening's darkness settles, my sentences spiral away like comets through space, and the children are like three silent blue planets, or three bright moons, or a trio of tiny distant stars shining with me in the dim universe of our house. When they say nothing, I pull the chain on a lamp to light the room, adding that sometimes I feel like Franz Kafka. <laughs> Who is Franz Kafka, they ask. I tell them, He's a hero of mine, a writer who wrote books that stab us and affect us like disasters, like suicide, like the death of someone we love more than ourselves. The three of them say, yes, exactly right, and Google Kafka on their cell phones. <laughs> they read his aphorisms aloud. A cage went in search of a bird which immediately they say should have been translated, a cage flies off in search of a bird. <laughs> then Andrew says, barrenness is not so bad. Depends on how you look at it. With a wink, William says he likes my poems for their vast white spaces, those wide silences he can enter at the line's end. <laughs> Sarah innocently agrees. She says margins are like towering white clouds that recreate and restore us high above the earth. Every line of a poem, she says, is a leap and a fall from heaven to the next line, where with renewed strength, I say, taking up the thought, we face life's next terror, life's next wonder.
I, I wasn't really planning on finishing with this poem, but I think I will. Um, it's, it's strange when you write a, a lot of poems and you write a lot of books and then you get to the end of them and it's sort of like, well, what do I do now? <laughs> you know, it's a really odd feeling um, and I don't have an answer for that. Uh, so if anyone does, I'll, I'll be at the table during Go the break. <laughs> Go to Ralph's and get a chicken. <laughs> <laughs> so this poem is called Socks. After many long years, I finally finished the book I was writing. I wondered what to do next. My whole day ahead of me, I decided to tidy the sock drawer, an impossible jumble of lone survivors and mismatched pairs. I pulled the big drawer out and emptied onto the bed a small mountain of socks. I began to arrange by color the red ones I bought in Rome at Gamarelli's, the pink ones found in a, French, uh, in a Paris street market. I began lining up all my socks, much as I do with my poems, and tenderly folding them one on top of the other in pairs. I scolded myself for neglecting just how important socks are to a poet walking the path, how necessary to cushion and adorn the two feet that carry the heart up and down the ladders of heaven. Slowly, I lined the waiting drawer like a rainbow, from yellow to purple, noting the black socks ran on and on like an ellipsis. Then I put the drawer back. It was only noon. The room was bright. All morning, I'd worked in my bare feet, and now my feet were cold. I wanted to lie on the bed and daydream, but not before I thought to put on a fresh pair of soft white socks, warm white socks with soles so pristine and unsullied it was as though they had never been anywhere. Thanks, thanks, thanks. You, you know, I think when you're a poet or a writer, you all the lines that all the poets from Homer to the present, they're, they're in your head. They float around in your head. And sometimes you forget whether Shakespeare wrote it or uh, a poet you met in Brooklyn or something. You just, they, they, they cease to have any kind of hierarchy. They're just in your head. And uh, once in a while, a, a piece of a line will come out of your head and who knows, it might be a paraphrase of Shakespeare or something, and you can't even tell, you don't remember. And I had a poem in my book, Breaking, on, uh, Breaking Down the Surface of the World, about uh, my father's funeral, and how after the funeral uh, got into the, uh, the black limousines and you know, were driven off from the cemetery. And there's a line in one of Richard's poems from Country of Air, in which, uh, he talks about being uh, driven into, the, uh, into his life as a man. And that line is in my head. And I, I, you know, I read Richard's poems often, forgotten. So I ended this poem uh, after the funeral. Then I am driven in a line of dark cars everywhere except into my life as a man. And Lori is editing my poems, and she cuts it and just says, no, just say, into my life as a man. She says, that's better. <laughs> and I go, yeah, you're right. Yeah, you know, I keep it. And the book comes out. And not long after that, I'm reading one of Richard's poems again, and there's the line, into my life as a man. And I went, that's Richard's line. I, 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 so for the next edition, I had to change it back. And I, I said to Lori, yeah, it's not as good as Richard's line, but I, 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 can't, I can't do Richard's lines. So, um, but, but he, he charged me a fee, and, and, and it was okay. So I just want to say again, I'm just so 
appreciative to be here and thankful to Jack for friendship over the years. And also just to all of you, I know a lot of you, I've seen so many of you over the years, I feel like we've um, been friends. And I don't remember everyone's name, but I always remember the faces. Although the other night I went up to someone and went, I know you, and she went, no you don't. <laughs> So, you're so warm, I just feel like I know everyone, even the people that I don't know. Um, I also want to thank, you know, Kevin and Lisa and Bambi for just running everything, like leaving going out, Lori for helping, and Josh. Um, just thank you all for um, making all this possible. So, um, I, I want to do my, oh. oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. Hello? <laughs> Walt? Walt, I'm... I'm getting ready to introduce Jack. Uh, Emily's with you? And Rilke? And Rumi? Dante's with you? You're, you're coming to the reading. Ken Kesey is going to get everyone on the bus. I'll, I'll make sure the back door is open and we'll, we'll save space for you. I'll give a long introduction. No, he, he, yeah, every Adam that you assume, Jack assumes, yes. Okay. All right. Give Emily a kiss. All right. Bye. I'm so I'm I'm so sorry. I am so sorry. I am so sorry. There are many things in this world I admire. Tornadoes, which can cut a path of destruction a mile wide through the center of town, or tsunamis that lift the ocean up and sweep houses and people out to sea. Or hurricanes that take out the electricity and leave us huddled for days around candles. Or floods that fill our houses with mud and water and leave nothing untouched and everything in ruins. But more than these, I admire Jack Grapes because he too is a powerful force of nature. But, as we all know, for we all know him, a benevolent force. <laughs> and more than that, a healing force, whose presence in our lives heals and repairs and restores and affirms. Jack's book is called The Last of the Outsiders, but really he's an insider, the true insider, the poet, who comes to us with his poems to be with us in our most intimate and vulnerable places. A poet who knows that poetry is the greatest force and who tenderly but mightily touches us with his love. Great. Someone said, Jack, you should quit while you're ahead. <laughs> this poem is called Firewood. I am old and have lost something while retaining my capacity for love. So many of you out there I knew, forgot, remember, miss. Surprise me, won't you? Open your arms and say welcome. I will walk into them, still crying. I will walk into them, unable to breathe, forgetting the past. Every time I thought I knew what love was, I discovered that love wasn't that at all. I just thought it was. It is June, and July will be here, then August and September, the month of my birth, and I will fall out of your arms into the world again, back into the rusted earth. If I am under the ground, inside this cold earth, remember, I brought love to this planet. Not much, not, not enough to make the scale tilt one way or the other, but it was enough to put a dent into your heart, enough to make trees break into pieces for firewood, so that when you warm the room in winter, you can think the fire came from me, as it did when I was alive. Oh. This is called What to Keep, What to Give Away. What I will take with me are the words. The rest you can have. 
the cars, the curtains, mm -hmm. the silver spoons, the chairs we sit in, the doors we slammed, the windows we dressed, the running shoes, the bow ties, the suits, the hats, the glasses we drank from, the cups we smashed at the Greek restaurant on Robertson Boulevard. Mm -hmm. I lingered a long time over passion, then gave it up with all the rest. What is passion, after all, but a longing for God? What do you, what do you have, asked the bartender. Passion, I say. <laughs> hey, I thought you gave, it all, you gave it up with all the rest, he says. Yeah, I know, but it was a mistake. <laughs> I've decided to take passion back. <laughs> ah, then you're still longing for God, he says. I should go to Barcelona, maybe Paris. Rome would be nice. St. Petersburg, I hear, is worth a trip. You can get good dope in Copenhagen. But what about Verona or, or Miami? Who in his right mind would want to go to Miami? <laughs> Verona, I can understand, but Miami? Listen, let me, even, let me, let, let me let. <laughs> Into my life as a man. What? <laughs> Fuck that poem up. <laughs> I, you know, I can't see because I'm teared up there. I'm kind of, you know, okay. All right. Where am I? 378. Passion, yes. Passion. What I will take with me are the words. Oh, no, that's the beginning of the poem. <laughs> All right, listen, let me let you in on a little secret. I got that one right. <laughs> <laughs> to what do you attribute your great success? Tiny. <laughs> All right, listen, let me let you in on a little secret. When I get there, we're talking about Miami, right? When I get there, my love will be waiting for me. She'll have one of those flotation devices, and she'll tell me the water's fine. I should just dive in. She'll show me around the condominium, a desk where I can write, a shelf for my favorite books, and lots of sugarless chocolate bars on the table I can eat to my heart's content. And she's wearing a bathing suit to boot. When was the last time I saw her in a bathing suit? I can't remember, but she's got great thighs. She's wearing that bathing suit, and I can admire her thighs. There she is, rising like Aphrodite from the sea. She was looking for me from the start, found me running in circles, came and got me, taught me how to run in a straight line toward God. Back to earth, millions of us in the oppressive heat, a drink in the morning, connection to spherical power and the ability to move heavy objects, persistence with charm, a star in the southern sky. You don't know where you're going. A hawk circles overhead, the calligraphy of bad manners, a wicker basket filled with all your mistakes, a white bird in a golden cage, dreams that taste like strawberry popsicles. Last night, I heard her voice talking on the phone in the kitchen, her voice along with the words and passion. That's what I'll take with me. You can keep all the rest. There's nothing like fucking up a poem to, you know, get rid of the butterflies. <laughs> I, I'm always a wreck before I read it, and, and same with acting, you know, and um, I can feel it, and it starts coming on about an hour and a half, two hours before, and it's, it's kind of like a horse, and you've got your reins on, and you don't want to let, you don't want to give it too much room, but you don't want to hold it back, you, 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 because all that nervousness is, is, is good, it's good. <coughs> Uh, I was in a production of Romeo and Juliet. I was playing Juliet, and uh, <laughs> I was I was in the wings. We we had multiple entrances. It was an opening tableau of the whole thing, and I was with the star actor of the show. And this was a long while ago. I was you know not the star actor, and. Uh, so I, I didn't want to bother him in the wings because I could you know he was doing his preparation. And he never said anything, never said anything to me. We, we didn't socialize in the wings before the play. I, I wouldn't want to mess up someone's work. And he turned to me and he said, oh, he says, does this ever end? And I said, what? He said, this nervousness. 
And I felt better. I went, oh, good. If he's nervous, <laughs> then I guess it's OK. And then it goes away. I, it's a weird thing. You step, when, when, you get, when you're in the character and you step into the situation, all of a sudden, all your work and all your preparation, you're in that life, and you're not nervous anymore, unless the character's nervous. Or, as my acting teacher used to say, bring everything with you. So if you are nervous, then the character's nervous. You know, it's, it's real. Never deny a real emotion on stage, he used to say. So, you know, if you crack up in the middle of a poem, fuck it, you know? <laughs> Let it be. Anyway, this is called The Dark and Stormy Night. I became a writer not because I had something to say or stories to tell, but because I fell in love with words. It doesn't matter where you are, the words can take you somewhere else. And sometimes, the words can change your life. I was six years old. Oh, no, no, I was five. Yeah, I had learned to read before I was five. I was crouched on the floor of the living room and it was raining. It was night. I could feel the rug beneath my knees, soft but a little scratchy. I was small, crouched on the floor, and everything was high above me. The chairs, the mantelpiece, the lamps on the end tables, the doilies on the arms of the armchairs. The book was blue. It was my treehouse. It was open to the first page, and there was a picture of a purple cow. Under the picture was a short, four-line poem. My mother stood in the doorway, the phone to her ear, her face red and contorted, her voice hysterical. She slammed the phone down. Your father is drunk, and he's coming home to chop our heads off, she said. <laughs> We're going to Mama's house. Then she hurried upstairs to get out things. I looked back at the purple cow, at the poem printed beneath it. I never saw a purple cow. I never hoped to see one. But I can tell you anyhow, I'd rather see than be one. Huh. Was there really such a thing as a purple cow? All the cows I'd seen were brown or black with white spots. I never saw a purple cow either. But maybe there were purple cows. If there were, where would they be? Maybe my dad would take me to the zoo or a farm and we could see one, I thought. Why wouldn't a person want to see a purple cow? Was it a bad thing to see? I was crouched there on the floor and I imagined for a moment that I was a purple cow and that no one wanted to see me. Maybe because I'd done something bad. <laughs> Probably because I was purple. No one wanted to see me because I was the wrong color. I looked back at the picture of the cow. All that purple on the page, I thought, was kind of pretty. I liked looking at the purple cow. Then I read the poem again. But I can tell you anyhow, I'd rather see than be one. Ooh, it was nice. I'd rather see than be. I whispered the words to myself. I'd rather see than be. I thought about the words. It was better to see a purple cow than to actually be a purple cow. Being a purple cow must be really bad. <laughs> you, you just didn't want to be a purple cow. It was bad enough seeing one, but it was worse to be one. If you had to make a choice, you'd choose to see rather than be one. And then the way the whole line rhymed with the other line, the rhyme inside and the rhyme at the end. I never saw a purple cow. I never hoped to see one. But I can tell you anyhow, I'd rather see than be one. My father was going to come home and chop our heads off, but I was thinking about the purple cow and how the words rhymed. Here's your suitcase, my mother said. You can carry it. My suitcase was really a duffel bag. She handed it to me and grabbed my arm and yanked me up. Let's go outside and wait for the taxi. We stood on the porch until the taxi came. It was still raining, a dark and stormy night. I'd, I'd read that in a book somewhere. <laughs> a dark and stormy night. It felt good to say the words to myself. It was a dark and stormy night. We were on the porch, but every so often a gust of wind blew some water onto the porch and my legs got wet. It was scary, but I liked it. The street was dark, but every once in a while a bolt of lightning would light everything up and you could see Mr. Senak's house across the street. You could see the muddy water swirling down the gutter. Then it would get dark again, and a few seconds later, a rumble of thunder seemed to shake the branches right off the trees. When the next bolt of lightning came, sure enough, there in the street were a few branches from the trees. I wanted to get a closer look, 
so I took a few steps toward the edge of the porch and waited for the next gust of wind. Don't stand in the rain, my mother said, and she yanked me back from the edge of the porch. She was talking and crying, but I wasn't listening. I was thinking about the purple cow, about the poem. I was thinking about the words, how the words were things you could play with, that with words you could make up poems and stories. I decided then that this was something I wanted to do. I wanted to write down words on a piece of paper and make things up, stories and poems. Maybe I wouldn't have to make anything up. Maybe I could tell stories about things that really happened. Maybe there'd be a boy somewhere who would want to read them, who would want to be someplace else. A yellow cab pulled up in front of the house. The cab driver got out and ran around to the other side of the cab and opened the door for us. He was all hunched over and getting wet. He wore a yellow cab driver's hat. We ran down the steps and got in the cab. I stepped in some muddy grass and heard the squish. Before he closed the door, another gust of wind blew the rain into the back seat. It was scary and exciting. My mother gave the cab driver the address of my grandmother's house. She lived in Metairie, a long drive. The taxi driver pulled down the handle on the meter and the numbers started rolling as he drove. The bigger the number, the more we'd have to pay. My mother had stopped being hysterical. She was rearranging the suitcases. When we turned the corner onto Ferret Street and headed up Napoleon Avenue, I leaned over and said to the cab driver, my father's coming home and he's gonna chop all our heads off. <laughs> then I went back to thinking about the purple cow. I was thinking I was gonna be a writer someday. I was gonna write about the purple cow and the dark and stormy night. <laughs> This poem is called Sunday Morning, and actually it's the title of a poem by Wallace Stevens, but it has nothing to do with that poem. Um, but I heard that you could, you could, you, you can't plagiarize a poet's line unless they're Richard Jones. <laughs> but I, I heard you could take a title, you could steal a title. So as soon as I heard that, I, I sat down and I found any, every title I liked that someone else had used and I started writing them down and writing poems to go with them, you know. So that's going to be my new creative thing. I'm just going to steal titles from other poets, you know, um, uh, or, or novelists, you know. I'm, I got War and Peace, I, you know, I got Moby Dick. Oh, I'm going to be famous one day. <laughs> Sunday morning. Sunday morning. I wake to the sun, lifting one leg over the top of the Tycor building on Wilshire Boulevard. The new leaves on the tree outside my bedroom window are tinged with sunlight. If only I were a photographer or a painter, I'd freeze this moment and crawl into it. Sunday morning. I have to get up, but my body wants to drown right here in the bed. Spring ambles up the street, waving its arms. I have a matinee today. I have to be at the theater by two. Yesterday, I find out from my agent that I didn't get the part I was counting on. Eat this, they say. It's good for you. You've eaten it before. The next one will be sweet. I eat and concentrate on the window, on the tree, on the sun beginning to beat its chest as it comes up over the top of the tallest building. I drive down Beverly Boulevard, take the curve where it changes into First Street, turn on Grand, and park right across from the museum. Now, for those of you who don't know how to get to Mocha, this poem, just keep it in your, <laughs> keep it in your glove compartment, and it says right there, goes to go down Beverly Boulevard, take the curve where it changes into First Street, turn on Grand, park right across from the museum. You'll never be lost. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't we just all go to the museum, you know? <laughs> it's just after 10. Hardly any cars are on the street. Mocha doesn't open till 11. The sun has followed me all the way, reflecting off the security Pacific Bank building, glass and steel going all the way up. I get off on this urban sleekness, especially the unfinished building across the street, another skeleton of steel and concrete. Someone should stick a sign on it, make it a part of Mocha, part of the permanent collection, and leave it just as it is, unfinished. No clear line where the museum ends and the rest of the city begins. One easy flow stretching all the way back into our homes, into the very center of our lives. 
I walk past the California Plaza sign, running my hand along the chrome and glass, then head downstairs for a cup of coffee and a cinnamon roll at the Il Panino. There's a girl two tables over in the sun. We both drink our coffee in silence, checking our watches, writing something down in our journals. She's an art student from Santa Barbara, come to see the Jasper Johns. She asks, what am I here to see? Oh, I say, the art, just the art. I don't care, just something. I am five years old. I don't understand anything. Hot and humid days, nights dark and mysterious. They take me to school. I stare at the blackboard. The kid from around, around the corner beats me up at recess. Some night my father doesn't come home. My mother shrieks on the telephone. My pet turtle dries up in the sun. My uncle dies on the floor in the empty kitchen. Who is the world? Why is the moon where the sun is? If the street goes nowhere, why is it in my bed? What is the rain that rains just rain, and why does it rain crows or bats or baseball gloves? How is the pencil writing my name, and why is my name the name for the thing that fixes tires, the name for the flag on the pirate ship, the name for the clown crushed in the box? Outside, the kids continue to jump rope on the sidewalk, singing, A, hey, my name is Alice, seeing everything but knowing nothing. I am six. The class takes a bus with Miss Cook to the Delgado Museum on Elysian Fields Avenue. We're going to see Vincent Van Gogh. Later, when I tell my mother, who was born in Antwerp, she says to say it like this, Vincent Van Gogh. And she coughs as she says it, Van Gogh, Van Gogh. <laughs> but Miss Cook says Van Gogh. We are marched single file from, from one room to another, walking past each painting that hangs just above our heads. I can't believe what I'm seeing. Everything mysterious and horrible about the world vanishes. Well, he paints like I paint. Trees outlined in black, all those wavy lines, all those colors, and, and he piles the paint on. He's wasting all that paint, just like I did before they told me not to waste all the paint. <laughs> He sees everything I see. The moon is where the sun is. The street that goes nowhere is in his bed. He, it's not just raining rain, it's raining crows and bats. He sees the blood, he sees the faces. Everything's so bright, it's on fire. Everything's so dark, it swallows me up. The man cuts his ear off. The man leans against the table so sad. The man dies on the floor of the empty kitchen. I stop in front of the painting with crows above a cornfield. The world I see is real. I bring my hand up and I touch the dried paint. The world I see is real. It's real. Mounds of paint, swirls of paint, rivers of paint. But it's not paint, it's real. It's the world. Don't touch the painting, Miss Cook yells. She pulls my hand away. She yanks my arm into the center of the room. Never, ever touch a painting. She shoves me into a seat in the back of the bus. But it doesn't matter. The world is real. I fold my hands in my lap. I know what I will do. I will write about the real world. Ooh, it's 11 o'clock. The girl heads toward the Jasper Johns. I walk into the J. Paul Getty Trust Gallery and find the geary cardboard chairs and cardboard houses. Can I sit in them, I ask the guard. They can be sat in, he says, but you can't sit in them. <laughs> oh, I say and walk into the room with the huge pavilion shaped like a fish. I walk into the belly of the fish. The wood inside is so beautiful. Don't touch the wood, please, says the guard. I wander over to the Norman video. A clown is being tortured on simultaneous video screens. Clown torture, it's called. <laughs> Later in the permanent collection, I bump into the girl from Santa Barbara. In the center of the room, a metal sculpture of a man moves his motorized mouth up and down, a silent yak, yak, yak. This I understand. I stand as close to it as I can. The guard watches me suspiciously. <laughs> Over in the North Gallery, there's an empty spot in one corner. Something was there, but it's been removed. So I make a little sign for myself, and I hang it around my neck. I stand in the corner of the permanent collection, North Gallery, as still as I can, one arm out in the gesture of an actor about to speak. Eat this. You've eaten it before. 
The next one will be sweet. The street that goes nowhere is in your bed. You know nothing, but you can see everything. A woman and a little girl walk up to me. What does the sign say, the girl asks. Touch me, her mother says. The sign says, touch me. <laughs> so the child reaches out a hand and touches my own. Aww. True story, it really happened. <laughs> uh, if any of you have a copy of, uh, what's it called again? Last of the Outsiders. Uh, I mean, you could look at it after the reading. I don't want you to follow the poem as I'm reading it. I just want you to look at the picture. Just take a look at it. It's on page 389, verse 7, chapter, chapter 7, verse 2. Do you see the picture on, on the right-hand side of the page? Um, I, I think I've kept everything I ever wrote or drew or, from grammar school. And uh, I, lo I looked for it, and I found it. Uh, so it's from the fourth grade. October 12, 1951. I, I was very proud of my penmanship. I learned to write script very early, and I thought it was really cool, but I liked to print, too. So to me, printing and writing, they were like special things. And um, I had this knack for making World War I biplanes. So if you see those lines with the circle in the middle and the propeller. And I would enact these dramas by drawing lines and having bombs blow up and doing sound effects and everything. So this is referenced in the poem, and I'm, I found the picture, so I thought, I'll put it in the book. So, you know, you really get your money's worth of this book. You, you, you know, get that drawing stuff. I mean, that's, that's nothing. I mean, that's not nothing. You know, it's pretty good. Uh, it's even got the three holes. You don't see the lines, but there were the blue lines. But blue doesn't reproduce, so um, it wasn't on blank paper. It was on loose leaf paper, you know, in school. This poem is called Oblivion. Wispy clouds break into white teacups as I pick up a fresh pencil, one with a point so sharp it might break with the smallest word like of or in or at. I would hardly expect it to survive a word like Mozambique or disheveled. When I was in fourth grade, Mrs. Aim yelled at me during vocabulary tests for the sound effects I made of explosions and crashes <laughs> as I drew pictures of World War I biplanes along the words on the paper accompanied by smoke and flames and the occasional biplane crashing into the trees below. If you look at the bottom right-hand corner, you can see a biplane <laughs> crashing into the tree there. I was uh, easily distracted in fourth grade, and today I contemplate the landscape outside my window like a surveyor looking for the best spot to build a suburban village. I should be paying bills, but I get distracted by a pencil, and then distracted by words, and then by a memory of a moment in the classroom when I had to walk that tightrope between doing what I was told to do and doing what my imagination implored. I haven't the faintest idea how I managed to survive this long with no real strategy for living. I have gone from one distracted impulse to another, holding on to the only things that have ever mattered to me, love, fraternity, community. That is not to say that I have always been kind or compassionate. This is not to say that I have never twisted love for my own purposes hurt others, taken advantage of affection. This is not to say that I have not fled from the tribe and crawled into the hole of my solitude where I answer to no one, not even myself. Those clouds out there and the hills in the distance oblivious to the violence we do to ourselves, even they can't hold my attention for long. But I never grow tired of my desk. It's familiar mess of paper clips and coins, the letter opener I had since college, the Elmer's glue I haven't touched since Josh was a kid, <laughs> the lamps, they're like swans, aren't they, with their long, flexible necks, and the stacks of books beneath the stacks of paper, and the bills that require me to work to go out into the world I love, but could so easily forget if I allowed to daydream not this long. Where else would I be without them? in a biplane, probably, mm -hmm. above the earth. The poet as Red Baron, dropping words onto the trees below. Kaboom! Kaboom! 
laying waste to the vocabulary of my life, from Mozambique to Timbuktu, hair disheveled, smoke and flames, the sweet implosions by which I live. What gets lost? Some rivers run wild, some deep, some, like the one in my throat, hinge on memory and every hook, line, and sinker that floats to the bottom. Les poèmes viennent et vont. A deer once came to our campsite. Up close, he looked big and dangerous, not like something in a Disney movie. I told him to stay where he was, and he obeyed. This big buck obeyed. We had an understanding. It's not like that with the world. Brief marken blieben for Emma. I never practiced the piano. What was I waiting for? You can only wait so long, then it's time to get your coat and say goodbye to the others. My wife thinks I take too long saying goodbye, a lingering. What's the rush? Something might happen. Someone might say something. Then where would I be? In the car, driving home, missing the best of it. <laughs> That'd be a fine how do you do. Like being in the middle of the journey of your life and finding yourself lost, peruna selva oscura, blah, 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 the straight path, the narrow way, the right road, etc. So say you're walled up inside a dream. Fixed forms vanish. Vida y muerte eran mi cuatro sesgado. The moon sits there all alone, begging to be worshipped. Miro actually set his canvases on fire, not with paint, but with matches. I was thinking now, I'm not thinking, now I'm thinking again. Transcendence, the existence of others, negation, contraction, the body, temporality, translator's introduction, dialectical carports, the concept of carburetors, flashlights, penny ante card games, still too soon to discuss the Hegelian concept itself, but being is always reduced by a signification of the existence, enveloped by essence, and the effort each of us makes to rediscover the immediate in terms of the mediated, the abstract in terms of the concrete on which it is grounded. I am the body. I am the existence. I am the signification. You're always getting at something, but like the deer, it bolts off into the forest, the oscura forest, the dark forest, as the poets say, the one you get lost in, the one you have to enter to get the thing you are getting at. Life is this one big how do you do, and then it'll be time to get your coat and say goodbye to the others, to the body, to the temporality, to the negation, to the moon, to the transcendence, to the rivers running wild, the canvases of flame, the translator's introduction, the translation itself, what gets lost in the poetry. Oh, wow. You like that? It's so funny, you never know, you know, you just never know if you... You know, it's like Richard talks about editing, you know, and you can edit till the cows come home, but uh, it's like the tree that falls in the forest, you know, if you, I don't know, you, you, sometimes you don't know. Um, there was a lot of tumult, which I thought was a Yiddish word, by the way. There was a lot of tumult in my house growing up. My father was a, an alcoholic, drank a lot. My mother, according to my therapist, said she was a paranoid schizophrenic. Uh, she was always slapping me. Um, there's a Flemish word she used for a slap in the face. It's called a plavai. So if I did anything wrong, oh, you're going to get such a plavai, and it was the back of her hand. And um, um, so it was just scary. I loved horror movies. I really loved horror movies. Because you could go in there, and you could get the shit scared out of you, and you knew you were safe. <laughs> You know, you knew it was safe, so you could just let yourself go. In the house, you, you had to be calm, you had to be careful. Uh, uh, you just didn't want to upset, you know, where's dad? Is he coming home? Is he okay? It's okay, mom. So, you know, all that stuff. Um, so the horror movie, and the, the two monsters were Dracula and Frankenstein for, for me. I mean, now they got a lot of them, but those were the two, that was a comedy team of, of terror. <laughs> Frankenstein, I got right away. You know, he was, if not the abused child, he was the child who was not understood. You know, people didn't get him. He tried to do good things, but it always got fucked up. He's putting the flowers off the daisy, and then he runs out, so he looks at the little girl, and he picks her up, and he's going to throw her in the lake. And 
you're in the, you're, what are you, I'm seven years old. We used to walk to the, the Tivoli Theater. In those days, parents didn't, you know, we just could go at night. And we're in the theater, and he goes to pick up the girl. I go, no, I'm trying to protect Frankenstein. <laughs> I wasn't really scared of Frankenstein. I love Frankenstein. He meant well, you know, he, he didn't mean anything wrong. Now, Dracula, I didn't get. He didn't scare me, but there was something about Dracula I didn't quite understand. When I got older, I understood what Dracula was about. <laughs> that, that, that kind of love where you and the loved one, you want to be locked forever in that height of passion that never changes, it never grows, you know, it never becomes anything else. You're just constantly, you know, I, I had a girlfriend once, I called her before bedtime for my room, and we decided to stay on the phone all night, <laughs> like we would be sleeping together. And then in the morning, one of us would go, hello, hello, and go, oh, yeah, hi, you know? <laughs> so it's like you're sleeping all night together. So, you know, that passion, that was Dracula. That's what Dracula was about. You suck each other's blood and you live forever. <laughs> And like Frankenstein, I felt bad for the Count. I felt bad for him. Because, gee, he couldn't get ice cream. <laughs> he couldn't go out in the daytime. You know, he would melt from the sun. And so, um, I wrote a poem about Dracula called The Count's Lament, which is in the tradition of the, you know, the old uh, Renaissance poem, the Lamentation, you know, the Lamentation. So this is called The Count's Lament. There are not too many ways to drink the blood. <laughs> Thick and slightly warm like pureed vichyssoise. Yeah. Sometimes I'll roll it around between cheek and palate just to get the taste again of what I've forgotten the taste of. Drinking it so much now out of desperation that perhaps even this, this sip is not enough anymore. Oh, perish that horrible thought. I go now from neck to neck, a throat to throat, reeling, scratching with my fingernails, flapping against invisible mist that issues from their mouths as they walk about the street in a cold that lies above the ground. Not a cold you can wave your arms in should you need to. Not the cold darkness I bask in, a darkness that has a taste, a dull texture that grinds in my sleep. Yeah, it's all the same. Flamingos. Daffodils. To dream of a blazing sun, just think of it. To dream of that burning and be unable to touch it, suck its fire in my own veins, down the gullet where it boils the substance of my flesh, then to wake, biting its splinters. That's no life for the count, believe me. Were I to drive drunken down one of your neon streets, what breath test would you give me when even the, 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 the flesh turns thin and white at the end of a century? Century. It's like a snap to me. All I vomit is blood. That sickness comes out of my throat just to be drunk again for fear of the waste or the indignity. Just to stand at a bar with a scotch and ice in my hand and clank the cubes around the glass and finish it off with a puff. The worms, uh, the rats, the, the, the beetles, the spider spinning his web for the unwary fly, tiny cracks of blood I've long disdained. And now, all there is left is you. <laughs> Your own meager supply that brightens with my pulse. Imagine what it could be like to flow in my veins for centuries without end. Uh, this, this piece is called The Big Wake. Um, a takeoff, obviously, on, you know, the big sleep. Um, this piece has been edited. I had a whole thing with Raymond Chandler and a detective, and I cut all that out so that it wouldn't take as long to read. It's made up of little parts. Uh, the, there's the office. Part two is the kid. Then there's the poem. Then there's the bed. And then there's the maze.
M-A-Z-E. When I moved out here 30 years ago, what I missed most was the rain in New Orleans, the damp air coming off the river, the cemeteries, the dark thoughts that form there as naturally as fungus. I hate the sun, its constancy, its persistence in the face of misery. I need rain, not Wordsworth's tranquil rain, but that hard, dark brooding, pounding on the windows rain. I want it filling the gutters, splashing knee-high off the sidewalks, flooding the streets till the shoes of the flat stomach joggers who pound that concrete squeak with it. I want it so wet outside that I won't be able to leave home without risking pneumonia. And I'll have to sit in my study, surrounded by my books, writing a poem, for God's sakes. How am I supposed to write a poem in anything in all this sunshine. You go outside to get the paper and the time it takes to bend over and pick it up, five people in pink lycra trot by. <laughs> the sweat like an emblem of purity trickling off their brows. They're in shape and getting shapelier. I'm fat and getting fatter. <laughs> if it doesn't rain soon, I'm going to publish a book of really bad poems. The worst crap I can write. <laughs> Trouble is I'm not writing bad poetry. I'm not writing any poetry. Later today I'll pick up Josh at school. Today's Tuesday, so Lori will bring him to karate and I'll get ready for my class tonight. Then after class, maybe I'll have a bowl of soup and read the sports page. Maybe instead of watching the 11 o'clock news, I'll sit at the computer and write some really bad poetry. <laughs> the Kid. I go pick up Josh at school. He's running around crazy, full of energy, dragging his backpack behind him with one hand, clutching loose sheets of drawing in the other. His shoelaces are untied. The arms of his sweatshirt are tied around his waist. He talks as we walk to the car, telling me about his Pokemon cards. There are 829 of these characters, some of which evolve into others. John's selling all his cards, he says, and he said he'd sell me his Mew, maybe his Charizard, maybe even his Wiggly stuff. I, I, I thought you had Wiggly Tough, I say. No, Dad, I said I had Jiggly Puff. Oh, well, why didn't you get a Charizard last week? No, Dad, we got Charmeleon. Charizard is the really rare one. He keeps talking. I, I can't, can't keep up with it all. It gives me a headache. I try to change the subject. So, how was school today? Good. Did you learn anything interesting? Good. No, really, Josh, I'm, tell me something about what you did in school. Good. Josh, I'm not in a silly mood. Can't we just have a normal conversation? Good. All right. Never mind. We'll just drive and say nothing. Good. Josh! What? Stop saying good. Okay, he says. Good, I say. <laughs> Look, Mom's not coming home till 6. What do you want for dinner? Wiener. Oh, you want a hot dog? Wiener. Josh! I'm not in the mood for this. I've got to get home and fix the toilet and get ready for my class tonight. Catherine's visiting from San Francisco. Wiener. Come on, Josh. What do you want for dinner? And don't say wiener. Good. <laughs> I take a deep breath and try not talking. Maybe if you ride along in silence for a while, he'll forget the whole thing. As we pass Cantor's, I say, hey, how about something from Cantor's? But. Josh, what's going on with this wiener butt business? Is this something you guys made up in school? Wiener. Okay. Okay. I'm done. We'll go home and I'll make something there. Josh opens my glove compartment and rummages around. He finds my sunglasses and he puts them on, trying to look cool. We drive in silence past McDonald's, Jan's Coffee Shop, Farmer's Market. It's going to be dark soon. The sun casts long shadows on the streets and sidewalk. I think about turning on the radio, but decide against it. There's something nice about riding along with Josh, saying nothing, just being together. Wiener, he says, more to himself than to me. Good, I say back, more to myself than to him. The poem. Class is over. I walk Jesse, have a bowl of soup, and decide to skip the sports page and the 11 o'clock news. I go into my study, surrounded by all my books, turn on the computer, and begin to write. But after three lines, I lose heart. I find myself very boring tonight. I did this, I did that, I think this, I think that, I feel this, I feel that. Ah, the house is quiet. It's past midnight. I go outside and Jesse trots along with me. The night's clear enough to see the lights of the houses in the Hollywood Hills. 
I look back at my house and try to find the familiar in its dark shadows. The air has a damp foretaste of rain. No stars are in sight. The moon almost full, surrounded by a halo. The bed. I go back inside, undressed, and slide under the covers and scoot over next to Lori. She's on her side, her back to me, so I spoon into her and wrap my arm around her waist. She mumbles something into the pillow. I put my hand down the back of her pajamas and rub her behind. It's smooth and warm. How things go tonight, I ask. She mumbles some more, trying not to wake up, something about Catherine and Josh and pizza. Was Josh okay going to bed? She groans a bit, then turns over to face me, snuggles into my chest. Yeah, he wouldn't stop talking, though. Something about a video game he's inventing. How was class? Good. Everything's going good, I said. <laughs> good, she answers. We lie there quietly for a minute. Are you okay, she asks, her eyes still closed. Yeah, I say. I started to write a poem tonight, but I quit after five lines. I got bored with it. We lie there in silence, sharing the warmth of our bodies. A car goes by in Orlando, loud rap music thumping from its speakers. The sound fades in the distance. Just before it disappears completely, a dog barks as if giving it an exclamation point. I want to talk some more, but I hear her breathing and assume she's fallen back asleep. But after 20 years together, it's as if she has her hand on my heart at all times. She can feel its yearnings, its sorrows. You know what, she says? What? We could go to Borders tomorrow when I get home. You could buy a few books, get some soup in the cafe. You could write a poem in your journal. Yeah, that sounds good. It's going to rain tomorrow. Really? Yeah, it, it, it's going to storm. Are, are you sure? Yeah, it, it's a big storm. It's moving down from Alaska. It's supposed to be hit by tomorrow night. A big storm, I say repeating it to myself before falling asleep. <laughs> this is the last section. It's called The Maze. The next afternoon, after class, I bring Catherine to the airport. A light drizzle is beginning to fall. Driving back, I take La Cienega through the Baldwin Hills. Above the horizon, storm clouds belly over the setting sun. In the distance, through a gray rain, I see the Emerald City, looking now like tarnished pieces of an erector set. By the time I get home, the rain's pounding on the roof of the car. Lori and Josh and I drive over to Borders. Lori takes Josh off to the kids' books. I go upstairs and get a bowl of soup and a book of poetry. I set my journal to the side and read until something plucks a chord in me. Then I open the journal to a blank page and I write the line, here comes the rain. Not a bad beginning. <laughs> I can write about the rain, how much I'd missed it, how without the rain I'm as dry as the desert, how I can't write, how I'm just writing bad poetry. Yeah, yeah, I think I'm onto something. I put the pen to the page, ready for a killer second line. Suddenly, Josh comes running up and drops a book on the table, almost knocking over the bowl of soup. Hey, Dad, look what I got. It's a book called Monster Mazes, and he wants me to do one. Josh, I I'm about to write a poem. Could we do this later? Dad, it'll only take a sack. I don't want to lose the poem I'm about to write. I, I think to tell him I'll be with him in a minute, but decide against it. He opens the book to one of the monster mazes. It's the hardest one in the book. So I negotiate the hardest maze in the monster book. It takes me nearly 20 minutes. Then when we're done, he decides to go look for another book. When he's gone, I open the journal again. I look at the line I wrote, here comes the rain, and I write a different poem instead. Monster maze. Here comes the rain. And my son Josh plops a book on the table, Monster Mazes. He's got me trying one on the first level of difficulty where you can perish if you stumble into a chamber of fire or fall into a pit of snakes. Other dangers lurk if you take the wrong path. I could become a welcome feast for rats if you run into them, he says. Giant spiders might drink my last drop of blood, and pit vipers will strike with poison fangs the moment I enter their lair. Every path I take leads to a horrible death. But Josh reassures me, these are really complicated mazes, Dad, but you can back up and try again. He takes my pen and shows me. Oh, I get it. And I 
persevere. He watches me, anticipating every wrong turn, whistling his little whistle when I seem to be on the right path. But it's tiring. I, I, I just want to go home and watch the Barrera Morales fight on TV. You're doing good, Dad, Josh says. He can tell I'm faltering. The lines of the maze begin to blur. I'll never get to the finish. I decide to cheat. <laughs> I move the pencil just enough to make it look like I'm concentrating on the path, but with my other eye, I focus on the finish line and work my way back towards the start. Yeah. But Josh is watching like a hawk now, hunched over the table, his head down just above the page. He warns me about the kraken, a terrible monster of the deep seas trapped eons ago <coughs> when an earthquake split the ocean floor. Now the kraken feeds on stray goblins and other hapless creatures. That's me, a hapless creature with bad eyesight and a shaky hand. The lines blur even more. I sense a, a feeling of despair, some great tugging at my heart. What am I doing in this maze? Where's my poem? The poem about the rain, it's gone, and here I am with nothing but the rapid pounding of the feet of the terrible minotaur who detests humans because they remind him that he was once human too. It's hopeless. I decide to cheat again. <laughs> I cross one of the lines and go directly to the path I know will take me to the finish line. But Josh is right there and he catches me. Hey, Dad, you, you can't cross the lines, he says. Oh, yeah, I didn't notice. That's okay, he says, helpful, optimistic, riding the back of my pencil towards certain victory. So I plod along past the giant worm in the pit of doom until suddenly I've reached the level where only the bravest dare go. You're in level four, Josh shouts. I can't finish this, I tell him. I'm tired of the whole preposterous journey. I look at him, hoping for permission to quit. He tilts his head to one side and gives me that look, his blue eyes full of confidence in me. You're almost there, he says, his face luminous and mysterious. I have no idea who he is. He's the light in the distance toward which I move every day, closer and closer. And when I finally get there, he'll be gone. I know. You're almost there, he croons. So we're in this together, my son and I. I decide to trust in blind luck. In a final chamber rests a fire-breathing dragon. His he is old and his hide is thick. His only comfort is to rest on the huge treasure he collected in his younger years. If we defeat this dragon, the gods will transport us by magic to the land of mortals, all our treasures in hand. I look outside for a second and watch the cars on La Cienega creep forward in the rain, coming down even harder now, a hard, heavy, dark rain. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Josh. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I don't know. He brings something out of you where it's okay to say anything you want to say. I thought I knew how to write until I took his classes. Then I realized. Not only did I become a better writer, but a better reader. Very early on, I saw some I saw something in a paper somewhere which called Jack an L.A. treasure, and he's always been that. He leads with his heart. He this is his gift, and if you watch him, he knows exactly how to deal with each person in the class. In their, it's just he's just amazing. Forget about my writing, what it did to my life. It's amazing. It's, it's the best method of finding oneself in the world. He is really life-changing for me on, on that writing level and the beauty of Jack and the, what he shares. Because Jack is a, a, pretty much a national treasure uh, and I think, I think after the first day that I took class with him I thought I, I really have to kind of just suck up as much of this man as I could possibly get my hands on. Uh, he's a true poet because poetry isn't just about what you write, it's about how you live. He has gestures that he does in his writing that are um, uh, dramatic, theatrical, 
uh, jazzy, improvisational, cerebral, intellectual, um, but always with a sense of, of the narrative and of, of bringing the reader or the audience or the listener along with to this new play. So Jack's poems are always a journey, and I, I love that about them. I don't like to reveal our secret, Jack, but you know what I really think of you. You know how much I love you, and it's, I'm not going to tell everybody. It's our secret, but I love you more than anything. Uh, so I'm supposed to say a few words of thank you, and um, it reminds me of Trump asking his cabinet members to say how wonderful he is, so you're wonderful. I love you, Jack. I don't think there's anything more to say than that. Jack, be nimble. Jack, be quick. Jack makes everyone jump over the candlestick. I love you, Jack. You are part of my heart. Thank you. I wanted to thank you for making me a better writer, a better reader, and as of last year, I'm a published poet. So thank you so much. Jack, I, I am so grateful for you in my life. Uh, you mean more to me than you could imagine. And uh, I love you to the moon and back and timing! Well, it's just a great big thank you of gratitude of opening up something in me that I had no idea was there and encouraging me every week. Uh, it's mind-boggling to me and thank you. Uh, Jack, there is no better guide <laughs> going up the mountain of creativeness uh, than thou. So I, I thank you very, very much for the set of tools that you offer and for the community of people that I've met walking the mountain with you. Thank you. It's everything to me. It means that they get to see the side of me that's the poet and not the teacher. I should go to Barcelona. <laughs> I haven't the faintest idea how I managed to survive this long with no real strategy for living. Driving back, I take lots of money to come back. If it doesn't rain soon, I'm going to publish a book of really bad poems. The worst crap I can write. <laughs> poems about my gratitude that I've made it this far and hopefully I can finish it up doing okay. I'm 77 years old and I promised Lori I would live to be 84 or 86, so I just hope I can finish up and finish everything I'm writing in my projects, that's all. I just want to just want to make it to the end in good shape. Josh opens my glove compartment and rummages around for two bases. He's got me trying one on the first level of difficulty where you could parry and I wanted filling the gutters, splashing knee high off the sidewalks, flooding the streets of the shoes of the <laughs> I thought it went well. It, it worked out. Every the, the the audience liked it, and I felt that I was authentic with the poems. And you know, I showed off a little bit, and you know, did some tricks and stuff. But I thought it went okay. <laughs> <laughs>